Good morning, everybody. Welcome. I am Steve. Hi, Steve. Hi, Steve. Hi. And I'm here to talk about Python packaging. And actually, when I wrote the title for this talk, um, shortly thereafter, I got a spelling lesson. Turns out there's a difference between a noob with an O and a noob with an E. And uh, maybe I was a noob with an O when I first uh, tried to learn about packaging because I really didn't know a thing about it. But they say a noob with an E is somebody who wants to learn and tries to learn. So I think I did that. Uh, you guys could be the judge at the end of this talk. But uh, let's hope we're noobs with an E. Um, so if you've done anything at all with Python, there's a really good chance you have used a package. If you've ever run pip install, you've installed a package. If you've imported anything in your Python source code, you've probably imported from a package. Um, you may even have created a package, and you might not even have realized you were doing it. If you put code in a subdirectory, and you put an init.py file in that subdirectory, you have a package. But that's not what we're mostly going to talk about this morning. We're going to talk about creating and publishing a package and putting it where other people can find it. Um, so why would you want to publish a package? Well, one reason is it's nice to share. Um, maybe you've written some really good code and you want to make it available to other people. Or maybe you've written some really good code and you want to sell it and make some money. Um, either way, making a package is a way you could distribute your code. I had kind of a different motivation for making my first package, and that was to break up a mono repo. Does anybody know what I'm talking about when I say a mono repo? One person. Okay, I better explain that. So, Can you speak up a little bit Yes, uh, absolutely. I'll try to get a little closer to the mic, too. Um, so a repo, of course, is your source code repository, and mono meaning one, so one big monolithic repository of source code. Now, where I work at Spincar, we've been developing the same product for about three years. And we just keep adding more and more features. Our code base keeps getting bigger. And um, it's getting a little hard to manage deployments and testing and adding new features without breaking existing ones. So uh, we're moving architecturally now toward splitting that into several smaller repositories. But of course, we still want to share code between them. We've got a lot of utility functions that would be useful to all. So a package is a great solution, in my case, for that. Um, any of our developers can install that package on his or her development workstation. And more important, we can install that package onto any servers where any of our software is deployed. Um, I'm just, I think I've got a screenshot here. OK, so yeah, I basically made a little Python project, I called it Spincar Live. So Spincar is the name of my company, Live is in library. These are some utility library functions that I've broken off into their own repo, and I'm going to make a package out of. Does that make sense so far? So just a little terminology. Uh, I know I got kind of confused about what is a module and what is a package. Um, a module is just a Python file. So there's a link here. There's a technical definition. A module is a file containing Python definitions and statements. It, it's just a Python file. If you've written Python code and saved it in a file, something.py, that's a module. A package, again, the technical definition maybe isn't that helpful. It says it's a way of structuring your files into a namespace. What that really means is you can have dot names, like package name, dot, module name. And what this, is a, what this accomplishes is it's a way for lots of different people to maybe have files of the same name and not collide with each other. Um, and if you put your files into a directory and you put a double underscore in it, a double underscore dot pi file in that directory, that is a package. Why the init.py file? Well, suppose you made a directory called string or some other thing that's a Python keyword or a built-in package in Python, you might inadvertently be taking precedence over that built-in package. So the init.py file is your flag to Python saying, I consciously choose to make this a package. Now, you don't have to put anything at all in an init.py file. It can be just empty, but you can put things in it. And it can be very useful, because if you put code in your init.py file, when Python loads your package, it will execute that code. So really, the, the most important thing we're going to talk about today is, or not today, but in this talk, is 
package distribution. So, you know, not installing packages, not using packages, but how you actually take the files of your Python project, put them in the proper directory structure, make a proper setup.py file, and put that up on a package repository like PyPI. So we're really going to cover that starting right now with some actual command line examples. Um, there's really pretty good documentation. There's a tutorial here, and these slides will be available to anybody who wants them. Uh, I'm not sure if the conference organizers are distributing, but if not, leave a business card with me. I'm happy to email them to you. Um, and then there's really just a couple of things you need to install in order to do packaging. And the first two things you need are pip and setup tools. So um, this is kind of funny. We're actually going to use pip to install pip. And of course, what that means is with the dash u, we're upgrading to the latest version. If you don't already have pip, I think you can use easy install to get it. But it's very likely that if you have a Python environment on your computer, you already have pip and setup tools. Still a good idea to do this and get the latest version of those. So we're just going to take this command, pip install, dash cap u, pip and setup tools. I'm going to run that here. And it's telling me I already have the most up-to-date version, so I'm good to go. Can everybody see that, by the way? Is the text large enough in the command window? Thank you. Um, the one other thing we really need to install is called Twine, and that is the utility that's going to let us upload our package to PyPI. And so same thing we're going to do, pip install dash cap u twine. And it looks like that's installed as well. So with those three things installed, I'm ready to go. The other thing, of course, I need is some Python code that I want to make into a package and a file called setup.py I'm going to cover that in a minute, but first let me just show you how we build the package. Then I will go back and show you the files that are inside it. So we're going to run our setup.py program, just like this, with the command line argument sdist, as in build a source distribution. So that runs, and I don't know if you can see down there at the bottom, it says creating dist. This actually made a new directory. It's called dist. And we have a zipped tar file in there. And what that really is is just a zip file of all of the Python source code in my package and a couple of metadata files that describe the package. So that's interesting, but it's not the most interesting thing we can do. What's a little more interesting is to make a built package. And this is what you can actually upload to PyPI for other people to have access to. It'll be searchable. It's got all kinds of good metadata associated with it. And for reasons I don't know, that's called a wheel. Does anybody know why it's called a wheel? 100 people in the room and nobody knows, right? Anybody? I don't know either. It's a great question. Um, but if we run the same thing, Python setup.py, but instead we give the argument bdist wheel, like this. Now when I look inside my disk directory, I've got a new file with the extension whl. That's my wheel file. And that's what I can actually send to PyPI. OK, so there are actually three different kinds of wheel files. And the example I'm going to be talking about today is what we call a pure Python wheel. So that means my, Pyth my project has only Python code. I don't have, for example, any compiled C modules. If I did, those would be compiled for a specific platform, like Linux or Windows. And then I would have to make what's called a platform wheel. Um, I've got pure Python, and my project happens to be targeted at Python 2.7. If it ran on Python 2 and 3, I could make what's called a universal wheel, and that could be installed on any version of Python. So kind of the most uh, general is the universal wheel. A little more specific, I'm making a um, pure Python wheel for Python 2, and the most locked down to a particular platform of all is what they call a platform wheel. OK, so we're ready to upload our package. And we're going to upload it to PyPI, um, which is the Python package index. And if you've ever done pip install and not given any like, fancy arguments or configuration to tell it to get packages from an alternative source, your packages are very probably coming from PyPI. Um, I'm actually not going to use PyPI because that's a production 
package repository, I'm going to use test PyPI. So that works pretty much exactly the same, except the keepers of test PyPI clean it up from time to time and delete leftover junk and like my package that shouldn't be on there will eventually go away. So to publish, we're going to use the twine command and we're going to give it the command line argument upload and we're going to tell it a repository URL. And this is where I'm telling it to use test.pypi.org. And what am I uploading? I'm uploading everything in my dist directory. So I think I've got this here where I can copy and paste it. Okay, and before you can use PyPI or test PyPI, you need to have a user account and that's totally free. You just go to the website and register and you will need to give your credentials when you want to upload. And I hope I typed these correctly. I did, so my package is uploading and then what could I get? I get an error, file already exists. Well, that's because before I gave this talk, I already uploaded the same package with the same version number, 1.1.0. And PyPI is saying, no, you can't overwrite that. People may already have installed it. They know this particular version as 1.1.0. You can't change it. What I could do is go into my source code, bump this version number to 1.1.1 or anything else. And we will talk about versioning in a moment, but that's why I can't overwrite it. But trust me, the package is already there. And in fact, I think we can even take a look. So this is test PyPI. I have to log in. I am logged in, good. Now I'm logged in. And my package is called spincar lib. And because there's metadata uploaded with my package, I'm able to search for that. And I can find it here on test PyPI. There it is. And we get a project description, and it tells us what Python platforms it's available for, and so on. So I've successfully uploaded my package to test PyPI. Now that it's there, I should be able to use pip to install it. Let's take a look. So yeah, with this pip command, and again, since I'm using test PyPI, I've got to tell pip this index URL command line argument. I'm pointing it at test.pypi.org. And this last argument is just the package name, spincarlib. Notice even though I named my package with an underscore, it actually gets renamed to a dash. That's just a, a naming convention. So let's grab this command and paste it. Okay, this is not asking for my um, PyPI password. This is because I'm using sudo when I run pip and it wants my sudo password. With that password entered, it installed my package, successfully installed, and we can prove that it's installed by doing pip freeze. We'll grep that, and we'll pipe that into a grep for spin car. All right, there it is. There's my package, spin car live version 1.1.0. So we made a package, we built it, we used twine to upload it, we used pip to install it, and it actually worked. That's, that's pretty cool. Live demos always scare me, but yay. Um, Okay, so I promised we would talk about what files actually go into that package and especially the setup.py and... Oh, just before we do that, one other note. Do I have to put my package on PyPI? No, there are other package repositories and um, the other thing that I could do is without even building a package at all, I can put my code on GitHub and there's actually this really great syntax for pip where I can install directly from GitHub. And this is really good for my use case, because remember, I'm not sharing because I'm nice and want to share the pizza. I'm sharing because I have multiple projects that I want to keep uh, for my own uh, company, for our own employees to use. So we do have a copy of this code on Git. And if you say pip install, and you give it a URL like git plus https colon slash slash github.com, and then your GitHub account name and your repo name, that will install. Um, and you can optionally put a, uh, what do they call these in GitHub? It's a tag, thank you. So you can go into GitHub, you can tag a specific version, I think they call them releases in the GitHub UI. 
So I tagged this as 1.1.0. That's a whole nother way I can distribute my code. Um, but back to, to what goes into your package. So the directory structure that they recommend in the packaging tutorial, make a directory for your Python project, and inside there make another subdirectory with the same name. And what that's going to do is when people install your package and they want to do an import in Python, it's going to make their imports work nicely. And the one file I really must have in addition to my, my packages, um, you know, my actual source code that does my own business logic is this setup.py file. And we're going to look at that in detail. So like I said, I have to have a setup.py and I may optionally have some other files. Um, if you put a setup.config file in the root of your package, then you can put some configuration directives. And those are basically equivalent to things that you could put at the command line that tell the, uh, the setup tools, the packaging utility, how to behave. Highly recommended that you put a readme in your package so people can see what it does. And it's recommended that that be in RST format. This manifest.in file is also optional. So again, setup tools has some default rules for which files in your package it will include. If you wanted to include more stuff, you can list it here. And finally, you're encouraged to have a license.txt file, which just tells your users the license under which your package is shared. So uh, setup.py gets pretty detailed what you can include in there. And there's pretty good documentation. I have a link. Um, I'm going to give, give you an example, and I'm going to point out some of the really important things inside it, which are packages, version, and classifiers. So let's look at the actual code at this point. This is a setup.py file from my actual spin car lab project. And the first thing we have to do is from setup tools import setup. So remember way back at the beginning we did pip install setup tools. That's got a, it's actually a function that we can call, it's called setup. And here's the call to setup. And we pass it a bunch of arguments that basically just describe our project and tell setup tools what to do with it. So the project has a name, it's called spin car lab. I'm going to come back to this version in a second. Um, you can put anything you want in the description, in the long description. It behooves you to give a good description because that's going to help people find your package. It's good to give a URL where people can get information about you or your company or your package. OK, this list of packages is really important. So let's look at the actual source code of Spin Car Lib. Here it is. And I'm sorry if this is kind of small, but so this is the root directory of spin car lib. And I'm sorry, this is the root of spin car lib. Here's our subdirectory following the recommended naming convention that you have a subdirectory of the same name inside. And here's a sub subdirectory. So I actually have a package in my package. Look, this is a subdirectory. It's got an init.py file, therefore it's a package. If I want setup tools to include not only my base spin car lib package, but also this common conf package, I have to tell it to do that. So this packages argument is just a list. And if you don't put something in that list, setup tools is going to ignore it. People are going to install your package. They're going to try to use your code. And they're going to get like error, cannot import common con for something terrible like that. Um, I'm going to skip a couple of these. Install requires. So this is actually a list of packages that your package needs, so namely its dependencies. I didn't fill that out here, but I think I do have an example of how that looks. Yeah, so there's an install requires. So this is from another one of my packages. I happen to know this one needs Boto, needs Paramico, it needs simple JSON. Um, has anybody here ever worked with a requirements.txt file? A couple people. So yeah, this probably looks really familiar if you've seen a requirements.txt file. It's the same idea except this is actually instructions to set up tools to tell it when people install my package, install these dependencies. Requirements.txt is only going to be executed if the person who downloads your package decides to. If he or she says pip install dash r requirements.txt. So you can actually make those identical to each other. You can make them different. Um, it's a little more than I can go into today to discuss all those subtleties, but there are some Pretty good explanations of it online. Here's a link to that. Um, suffice it to say, you probably want to have both and make sure people know what the dependencies of your package are. 
Uh, this last section, classifiers, I think I have a bigger screenshot of that. So this is like metadata about your project to help the people searching for it and using it know how to find it and use it. So development status could be anything from planning through production. So if you say it's in the planning stages, that's kind of a warning to people using it. Hey, this might not be fully baked. If you say it's production, it should be really fully baked, ready to use. And there are various stages you can indicate in between. Intended audience, this one's for developers. It's in English. Um, license, you can put whatever you want there. And programming language. So I mentioned earlier on, my package works with Python 2. And the recommended way to communicate that in the classifiers argument to set up is to say that it works for the languages Python colon colon 2 and Python colon colon 2.7. Remember, I built a pure Python wheel targeting Python 2. So this is consistent with that. Um, OK, so let's see if there's anything else interesting in our setup.py. So I think that's really all the arguments I passed. Oh, keywords. So keywords is your chance. Remember, we looked at PyPI, and I searched for my package. I searched by name, but I could have searched for keywords. And I searched utilities my package would have come up in the search. Probably a million others would too. So maybe that's not really a very granular set of keywords. But you can put whatever you want in here to help people find your package. Um, OK, so I wanted to talk a little more about the license argument. And I did kind of a weird trick here. So I could have kept this really simple. I could have just said, I'm sorry, not license, version. I could have kept this really simple. I could say like version equals 1.1.0. And that's totally fine. Um, first of all, you can use any versioning scheme you want. But remember that you do have to change your version number each time you publish a new version of your package to a package index. And also, the people who maintain PyPI recommend a particular versioning scheme, which is called semantic versioning. And that's just this version, where you've got the major, minor, and oh my goodness, what's the last M? Anybody? It's like your patch release? Patch. I think they call it something that starts with an M. But yeah, those, those three numbers. Thank you. So you know, this could go to 1.1. And then if I have a major new release, that could be 2.0.0. Um, so again, you can use any scheme you want. That's a recommended scheme. I did something a little bit more fancy. So I actually have a function called get version. And what this function is doing, it's a little bit ugly, but it's going into the spincar lib subdirectory. It's opening init.py as a file. And it's using a regex to look in the contents of that file for a version number, which is here. I'm sorry, it's not there. It's supposed to be there. My bad. Um, but why would you do that? It's a little extra trouble. The reason is there's a PEP recommendation that says you should put a version number in your project. And it.py is a good place to do it. And then who knows what the acronym DRY, D-R-Y, stands for? Yeah. Don't repeat yourself. That's right. So we don't want to put a version number in init.py and setup.py and then update it in one place and forget to update it in the other. So if I had done the right thing and put my version number here, now I'm reading it, I'm being dry about it. Um, so that's really a whirlwind tour of packaging. Um, I probably didn't cover everything, but if there are questions now, I'd be really happy to answer them. Bravo. Thank you. Question, yes? Hi, do you know why the underscores and dashes get, re get replaced? Because I see it swapping from underscore and dash and back to underscore. OK, the question is, why do underscores get replaced with dashes when you make a package? And the answer is, I don't know. But I can't tell you there tends to be a convention where names on the internet have dashes and names on your file system have underscores. But I really don't know if there's a hard and fast rule about that. Does anybody know? It's a good question. I wish I knew. Other questions? Yes, in the back. Uh, so the question is, what happens if you have a version conflict? 
between the dependencies in your setup and in your requirements.txt? And I guess the answer is if the person who installed your package ran requirements.txt, um, then I guess, well, it would get tricky, right? Because you can say you want an exact version, you can say you want greater than or equal to a certain version, and pip is just going to follow whatever rules you tell it. So basically, I think as the programmer of the package, you're responsible for not doing something mean to your user like that. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, what's up with that? I'm so confused. The question is about why are there eggs as well as wheels and should you still use them? And I actually was confused about that myself because remember I am a noob. And um, what I read about it is eggs were, they came up with eggs in 2004 and wheels in 2012. Wheels are preferred to eggs. And I don't know if there are bad things that might happen if you use an egg. Yeah, in the back. So the question is, if you're using enterprise Git, do you push a wheel to GitHub? And the answer is, I did not push a wheel to GitHub. I did two separate things. I pushed a wheel to PyPI, and I just pushed my, packet, my, my repo to GitHub in the usual way. So actually, two separate processes. So, so I guess calling your package from Git will be just a reverse effect of uploading it? Is it going to be the same effect as so the question is, is the effect of getting your package from a package index the same as getting it from Git? And the answer is yes, if you upload all the same files to both places. Well, I want to qualify that a little bit. Um, you're not going to have the dependencies from that list of installs when you install it from GitHub. So you would really have to install your dependencies. And one way to manage that would be by having a requirements.txt file. Yeah. Uh, if you have one package that is meant to be like some module or some package for another package, and then you update the sub package, do you then have to go back to like the higher level package and do something there to make it pull in the new updated version of some package, or will it automatically pull in the latest version? So the question is about having a, a package that depends on a sub package, and is there any automatic updating when you? update the sub package, and to the best of my knowledge, no, um, you would have to take care of updating that yourself. By the way, I'm, like I said, a noob. If anybody knows otherwise than how I'm answering these questions, please jump in. And are there other questions? Yeah. Okay, so the question was, have I had any problems with getting the packages installed when using PyTest that it requires? And I haven't had trouble with that. And in fact, please come to my talk on PyTest this afternoon. Okay. Uh, maybe it'll help. <laughs> yeah? fits out a boilerplate with all the other practice you're talking about, like set up I, ah. require the CXT, reading all that. Boilerplate generator. I'm pretty sure I've seen this Python. Are you aware of this? The question is, am I aware of a boilerplate generator that helps make your setup.py? Yeah, well, no, and that will basically generate a, a yeah. template, a skeleton package for you. Or that generates a skeleton package. I'd be really surprised if there is not one. I don't know of it. Do you know of one? I do not. It's not it was not a trick question. Yeah. Okay, in the room know of one. And if not, I think we should write one. We have one in our company, but it's um, just for us. So you wrote your own. Oh, that's that's pretty sweet. Well, you could make a package of that and share it with us on PyPI. Yeah. I think the Django um, Django book is a great So possibly Django offers it.
I see people are congregating in the back of the room for the next session, so maybe one more question. Anybody? No? Great. Thank you so much for coming. Okay.